My best moments in life are through sports. We didn't really have a Saturday or Sunday. There wasn't one. My dad would say, we work, we let others do in politics. Organizations are all about people. You learn a lot more when things get tougher. Going to Sweden and sitting there with management there and people will laugh because as a, an Italian, you get excited about things. You, in the Nordic culture, you don't react. You, you know, you find out that you look at backwards and what happened in your life through times and you say, well, how did it happen? Was that written somewhere? Uh, Welcome to Sports and Outdoor Mentors. In this episode, the first of a two-part series, I chat with Franco Foliato the Chief Executive Officer and President of Salomon. Franco started his career in junior sales roles, but quickly progressed to senior leadership positions with market leading brands, including the North Face, Columbia Sportswear, and now Salomon. I chat with Franco about key moments throughout his career, his passion for outdoor sports, his military service, plus much, much more. Before we get into the episode, I have one favor to ask, please hit subscribe. This helps us to continue to grow the channel, elevate the content, and to bring you insight from more great leaders from the sports and outdoor industry. Thanks for your support and enjoy the episode. Franco, looking back over your career, are there any key moments that you reflect on that were somehow particularly influential that brought you to where you are today? So sitting here today as the president and CEO of Salomon, a brand that last year achieved for the first time a billion euros of sales and has well over a thousand employees around the world? A great question, Dan, and thanks for asking. Um, yes, there is uh, a specific moment. Um, I grew up in the northeast of Italy in a small town, uh, um, a really sh a shoes town called Montebellona. And I grew up in a small family business. And um, literally when uh, the business was closed because my dad passed away and I went to business school, and I came out of business school, the dream for my family was for me to join a bank, which was um, really the, um, I would say, the ultimate destination for a good key coming out of a good family. Now, what happened is that I've been always a little bit of a rebel, and uh, ultimately I ended up uh, picking up a temporary job in a very small American company in the outdoor industry. And literally, um, I woke home, I had this job offer for this big bank, uh, dream job from for every kid in town, my early 20s, um, went home, told my mom, um, actually, I've refused the job, I'm going to work for this American, little American company in the outdoor industry. And she looked at me, she said, you got to be mad. There's no way you do it. And ultimately, she didn't talk to me for like a couple of months. And, uh, you know, there are moments in life and uh, you don't know this is a big choice. You just go after what you love. And uh, at that time made a lot of sense. Um, I wanted to grow up uh, in a global company. I didn't know even what a global company was, but I thought it was great to work for an American company. Um, I was born at the bottom of the Dolomites and Dolomites was a playground. Uh, I was the outdoor industry. I was uh, on a military service as an alpine team and literally I loved what I was, was the mountain, the climbing, the, hike, the hiking and the skiing and made sense. I was going to do, to work for a company that was doing what I love to do and, uh, and just, and that was a big, big decision. Uh, big decision because of eventually I ended up uh, um, traveling to the US, which was uh, something uh, early days in the mid 90s uh, uh, in a small industry. I ended up uh, challenged by different cultures uh, with global people, with people that uh, weren't Italians. And, uh, and all of that has been a big change. And I keep saying if um, I was going to work for a bank, I would have probably a completely different light, you know, and I was, how do, I, I, I didn't know that was a big choice. I just did what I thought I would enjoy most. You mentioned there a lot about your, your, your love. In fact, I use the word that you use, your love for outdoor sports. So, but where did that love come from? I and mean, was that something that was part of family life when you were growing up? I would say so. Um, we, we were born at the bottom of the Dolomites. Um, my dad was a hard worker. Uh, he, um, 
he really, and I was pretty much the industry coming out of the industry and the village coming out of the Second World War, the 60s, the 70s. I was a very entrepreneurial area. So he didn't have a lot of time for sports, but I grew up in sports. I played soccer, very good level. I did a lot of outdoor activity. Um, and literally, uh, personally, I felt that my family were playing a lot of sports, but literally I felt sports was uh, really um, what was I enjoyed the most. Whether it was a team sport or individual, uh, getting out of there was absolutely what made me feeling well. And, uh, and I, my best moments in life are through sports. So it's been since I was young, it's continued, it's evolved with different sports and I'm still competing and battling out there in the, in the outdoors or even if I can, sometimes I get into a soccer game. I just love it. You mentioned there that your, your father was, uh, you know, was working really hard when you were young. Do you think that work ethic has influenced you? Because I think, you know, when I look at your career and the roles that you have, I mean, there's no other way than to work extremely hard to be successful, I think. Yeah, for sure. It's, um, I call that probably one of the biggest assets I've got from uh, my family. Uh, the other one is the respect and the, the tradition and family. Uh, you know, this well, still my wife and I are a little bit the two rebels of the village because we left the village uh, since 20 years. We live abroad. Um, all our family members are still in town. Uh, so we're very because my wife, family and my family um, are very close. We grew up in the same village. Um, and uh, yes, that culture of respect for work, uh, for passion is definitely one of the biggest. Ash. I keep saying I don't have a job. I, I literally I don't. I mean, this you can't call it the job. Look around you. You've got skis, running shoes, uh, hiking. Um, I think I'm probably one. I reputate myself as one of the, the the most fortunate person in the world. I do what I love. I don't consider this being a job. That uh, passion for work and respect for work um, is probably one of the biggest assets that come out, in particular from my dad. You know. We, we didn't really have a Saturday on Sundays. There wasn't one. It was, um, my, my dad would say, we work, we let others do in politics. Um, which, you know, some, you can agree or disagree with this, but that was his statement. That respect for the culture work was absolutely the key asset. And, and he was able to do that with passion. That's the other big difference. I would remember cleaning um, the place where people were working on a Sunday with my dad ordering pizza and Coke as a reward. And that would be one of the best time we ever had with the family, just regrouping. So the work was also was going beyond being something to do, it was a, a way to connect the family, a way to regroup in a more confidential way. And all of those uh, are great assets that I've been uh, using over the years. When we get uh, management together, um, you know, I bring management in an offsite. It becomes a little bit of what we used to do with my family. Going in a place, regrouping in a more confidential way, getting away from the daily business to reinforce the, um, the link across the different members. Um, and this is a great asset. I, I, I will never be uh, thankful enough for those great assets, no doubt about that. So you you studied business administration at Venice University. Yeah. And then as you already mentioned, you then went into military service. I'm wondering, looking back, is there any, did that kind of influence you in any way, that period of military service? Oh yeah, it was, um, I was an officer and went to school. Um, the people's management was a big thing. Uh, you know, you find out your early, 20s. The rule when you go in um, military school, um, you have to, if you are going to ask 100 to your people later, you have to be able to deliver 200. So the, the officer, the teachers will ask 200, will get out as, as out of bed overnight, uh, doing act activities. Then they're going to get, they were getting us in school in the morning and it was a very intensive period, short, very intensive. And then what happened is um, 
um, I did my service, which for us at that time, we, we didn't have a lot of money, we were paid, it was a great opportunity, but literally we were challenged with uh, some uh, um, activities in particular, we, you know, we, were, we spent time down during the mafia time in Sicily. Um, I had to run a few hundred people, be responsible for a few hundred people. You're bringing kids to guard sites or protect sites. Uh, when I'm saying kids, it's 18 years old people. They never moved from their own village and suddenly they have a gun or um, to, to protect the site. Um, so it's, it's a, a learning lesson, very many learning lessons about uh, your people taking care, going beyond uh, to understand what's happening in the back, what their mental situation, mental status, who, you know, taking care of them, feeling the responsibility that, you know, what you do will be influencing several hundred people. And that was, when you do that in the early 20s, boy, I tell you, you know, the sleep is not great. Now, did we know exactly what we were doing? I wouldn't say so. Um, you know, we were learning and we had the challenging situation. And you know what? We learn more from these uh, challenging situation than what we learn when things were going. Uh, but definitely people's management was a big thing coming out of that. You would, you know, literally, you know, you come out of school, you get into a, I call that the washing machine and the military school for six months. And then you got thrown out there to run a few hundred people and literally you say, okay, how, how I'm going to do this? And you're early twenties, you don't have a 30 years of experience in the back. Uh, so that was a great learning school in particular for people taking care of people, you know, ultimately organization are all about people. And that's where the learning um, was great there. So you've worked for some very prominent names in the industry. So obviously to name, but a few, so North Face, Billabong, Columbia, now Salomon. When you reflect on your career path, how do you feel about it? And and looking back, is there anything that you'd do differently if you could do it all again? Um, great question. I think the, yes, I've been fortunate to work with some of the best brands in the planet. No debate about that. Um, my early days with North Face, I, I was young. Um, I lived through many phases, North Face, uh, uh, prior acquisition, after acquisition, uh, was a great learning curve, uh, did different jobs, um, had great mentors and people, I didn't even know what a mentor was, uh, literally, I mean, you know, people weren't talking about mentor, I just had the boss who was great and uh, it's been a, one of the greatest assets I had at that time. I never really had a very high responsibilities. Um, and that was uh, the phase one. Again, it was um, literally learning about um, how a global company works, how you interact with different cultures, spending a lot of time in the US. Um, I remember, you know, going to Sweden and sitting there with management there and people will laugh because as a, an Italian, you get excited about things, you, you know. And um, in, in the Nordic culture, you don't react uh, in a very open way, or you're acting, but very, in a very different way from an Italian. And I, I didn't know, I just felt, I got excited and I started to do uh, sentences that and people were laughing, looking at me, you know. So you have those things that you kind of learn over time. Uh, that was a great culture, but never had a huge responsibility. I was, uh, ended up running the Western Europe side. I was doing great with office and Literally what happened is um, uh, my wife wanted to go back to Italy. Uh, we wanted to build a family. We're living in Paris. Uh, she's a lawyer. Um, I was running around in the world to, for business and ultimately wanted to take a, a little easier going maybe back to Italy uh, to grow the family. And uh, they actually Bellabon did a great job with my family, with my wife, in the meaning that, uh, you know, they invited us for a weekend in the southwest of France. And you know exactly what I'm talking about because you got in love with the region, a uh, great culture. My wife, one day, I still remember after a weekend in Biarritz, she looked at me and said, I want to live here. And I'm like, I thought you said you wanted to go back to Italy. And she said, no, you don't understand. This is my dream, a Labrador walking on the beach. And we ultimately ended up moving down there, grew a family with Bellabong, uh, had a great time there. Um, 
I would never say I'm a surfer. I got uh, respected and I, I surf. I got respected from the culture, but I didn't grow up in the culture. Uh, they just always saw me as an outdoor guy who came into, but they love what the passion I had for the brand. And we interact very well. Our family grew up there. Uh, you know, our kids were born in Bayonne. Uh, we had a great time. We still have a place down there. We still have a, a lot of friends down there. Uh, we go, ultimately, we're going to sometimes spend a few months a year down there. Literally, we love the place. And then literally um, eight years, we thought that we were great. Business was growing, was on fire, great margins. Uh, and we were looking at us, oh, oh my gosh, we're so good. Well, this is all because of us, right? And then suddenly market trends, global financial crisis, and uh, literally the last couple of years were probably the most important from a career perspective because we had to do a lot of work, including restructuring. And you suddenly find out that, you know, you learn a lot more when things get tougher. No debate about that. And then uh, again, it's um, year number 10, you sit in there and you suddenly get a phone call. Uh, I wasn't looking for a job. I was uh, probably thinking about going back to the mountain. I was missing a mountain. If a Sunday you have the Pyrenees down there and literally, you know, call that being lucky or whatever. I got a phone call from uh, a an incredible gentleman and chairman of Colombia and who said, hey, I'm coming to Europe. Um, I've been told your name, want to meet with you. Let's have dinner together. And it, it was absolutely a great opportunity to connect with the, the Colombia family. And, um, you know, and it was easy choice, honestly. You, you live in Biarritz, uh, you walk home, and you tell your wife, well, maybe we're going to move. And she's now not sure. And then you say, well, we, you know, the opportunity, we're going to move to Annecy. She's, well, you know, that's a pretty good move. Yes. Why don't we go and look for a place there? And we literally came here for, with the kids. Uh, we have been here many times, obviously, in particular with North Face. Um, we bought a place straight away. Um, we wanted to live next to the mountains and we wanted to keep this double connection. So our dream has been always six months at the mountain, six months to uh, in a, on the sea. I didn't get to buy a cabin at 2000 meters. Um, I was not successful with my wife with this, but we got a, a great place uh, outside the Annecy. Um, literally, I go up with the dogs running on a trail from my backyard. And, uh, and that was a change in lifestyle. Um, great opportunity to connect with an unbelievable brand, completely different from North Face but still one of the brands that built, uh, one of the largest outdoor brands, as well as a, a brand that built the outdoor industry in a different way from North Face. Um, it was a great ride. Um, you know, I actually got the opportunity and pleasure and the honor to meet you there. Um, we had a great time. Uh, it was a little tough at the beginning, but then things turned out very well. And we were doing great. Um, and one day I got a phone call, you know, chairman and the board said, well, we think we like what you've done in Europe. Maybe you can give us a hand. We, what about moving to the US, to Portland? I don't think it was really a question. I think it was more a imagine. statement, <laughs> right? Um, and you met the team, you know, to how such a great uh, uh, gentleman he is. And um, what, but we, we were happy to move there. Um, it was a little difficult, you know, you're getting mid forties, late forties, if oh, maybe I'm, I'm pretty good here, but, and I was going to Portland all the time. And, um, and literally we decided to move there with the family, uh, got engaged straight away with the town, with the lifestyle, the Pacific Northwest, uh, the kids got there. They were literally, I think uh, we've seen our kids become going from being children into teenagers when we moved to the US. So that's where our connectivity with the US is still very strong. Um, and we had a great time until COVID came. COVID was a little bit of a rush. Um, things were great. And my wife at a certain point started to say, maybe it's time to go back. And uh, I was like, mm, not sure, you know, we're good here, kids love it. Uh, but. I think she felt she wanted to get closer to the family. And um, I told my wife, actually, it's a funny story because I told my wife, look, 
stop, we're not going to go back until, you know, I'm so good here with Colombia. I love team. He's a great gentleman. The brand is doing very well. The company is doing very well. And I think I've got a mission here to continue. And just to make sure she was stop complaining, I told her, look, I'm, the only f- call I eventually will pick up will be Solomon. And, uh, you know, I think she made things happening, actually, because uh, a few months later, six months later, I got a phone call as well. We're looking for a CEO of Solomon. And uh, we thought you, you know, you could be interested in the job. And uh, literally, you know, you find out that you look at backwards and what happened in your life through times. And you say, well, how did it happen? How was that written somewhere? I don't know. I mean, it's, it was fun. And um, it, it was an immediate love. Obviously, I'm a, you know, I do a lot of trail running. Solomon has been a competitor as a brand that I, I'm passionate about. You know, I got in my office, my Cross Max from 2001. Um, I, I had my old skis from, from the 90s. Uh, it's just a, a, one of those brands you always feel honored to contribute to and uh, with a great team. So it's, um, again, it's, you're sitting there, it's, it's, why did that happen to me? You know, why did I end up working for a bank and just uh, doing uh, that type of stuff? And, and, and again, what was the driver was always the passion, the brand, the passion, the people and the sports. Yeah. Those are the two, the, the things that made me always making a decision. And I literally, I remember when I was in Porto, I had this opportunity to come back to Europe working in a slightly different in- industry with a much bigger business. And, and again, I could have accepted it was a bigger job and all of this. I didn't feel it, I really wanted to move out of the industry. I felt that I wanted to work for the industry I loved, which was, uh, um, you know, the outdoors and the sport. And uh, I was not going to compromise what I wanted. And I was in a lucky position because I could choose. So, you know, that was a, definitely a fortunate position. And I was uh, lucky enough that my family followed me on all those decisions. I keep saying I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today if when we were living in Paris and uh, we were so busy and my wife said, well, we sat down and said we have, we want to grow the family and we were in the early 30s and I said, well, this is not going to work on the way we are today. And uh, she was ultimately the one who made the choice of stepping back. So, you know, it's a choice, right? It's a family choice. You do that together with somebody else. If my wife would have said, look, I want my career, you know, I probably would not maybe have the job I have today, or I did probably would have not enjoyed what I'm doing today as much as I am. And, th- and those are moments. Life is built on moments. Those are moments that are shaping people. Uh, we look back when we sit um, and discuss about this and we think, you know, we're being unfortunate. And she said, look, yeah, it's been a tough choice to move on and leave my career. But what was inspiring was your passion for the work and what you were doing. And that's where it made me easier to take that choice to step back. And again, moments. Okay, yeah. life is defined by moments, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And you've spoken there a lot about your, your wife particularly, but your family. And of course, having a role as you do, but also having the responsibility of being a husband, being a father, are there any, let's say, non-negotiables that kind of you personally hold to ensure that you maintain a good balance between those? I tell you a story. Uh, I remember being with, uh, having dinner once with uh, the CEO of a large corporate business. I'm not going to say the name. Uh, I mean, one of those really top guys. And... Um, and he was old, 15 years older than me, had four kids. And he, he said to me, and I was like 35, 36, um, maybe late 30s, and uh, uh, kids were just born. Um, and he said to me, I don't know how you do this. I can't get it right. And I'm saying, what do you mean? With the family, he says, I just can't. Um, you know, I don't have enough time and blah, blah, blah. And, and I, I was early, you know, late, for a later 30s and he was again it was early 50s and i said well you know i think i'm getting this right because i really i'm dedicating i, I want quality to time and he looks at me and says rubbish and i'm like what what do you mean he says you're gonna see this 
family needs quantity as quality. And um, you're going to find out over time that uh, you will need to do a lot of compromise. Now, there's no perfect balance. It's a choice. And the choice is done across the family members. Um, but don't ever think quality is enough. There's a time where you're going to need to be close to your kids. They're going to need to fill you. And that same story came through my brother, you know, later, my brother is 11 years uh, um, older than me, has been always one of my life mentor. And um, he, you know, he always would say, stay in the back, don't go out of that dinner, don't do this, just make sure, you know, you feel, the kids feel you when, when, um, when you're there. So there is no perfect rule, it's a trade-off. Um, I keep saying if someone gets the perfect sauce or the perfect mix, I'm ready to have this conversation. I, I can't wait to learn. Um, is there's a high ends and low ends. Um, I think um, I've been always uh, um, fortunate enough to engage in a lot of my travel in my family. So, you know, okay. we moved to Portland. I could have said, well, I'm going to be moving first and we'll see two years later. I had a lot of friends that were their family didn't follow. And my wife said, well, we're ready. We're coming. We're coming with you. You're going there. We're coming with you. When I moved to France from Italy, same story. My wife said, well, I'm coming. We're going together. We're doing this together. So that sharing of experiences has been one of the strengths of the family. Yeah. And we always connect work, the, the line between work and family has always been uh, very, and it was a choice. Um, you know, I don't, people, my wife will say, how, how many hours do you work in a day? 24, because you never stop. And, you know, a lot of people says, well, you have to be able to cut between the two. I can't. Okay, now, can I live with the balance? Yes, because I love what I'm doing. So the the passion will come together with the work. You know, when I keep saying my ambition is to test every single product we build. Um, and I try hard. So when I get out of home, uh, out of the office and I go home, if I go for a run or a walk with my wife and the dogs, um, I just gonna put on a new pair of shoes. Is that work? Is that a passion? Is that family? I don't know. It makes no difference to me. I've been always fortunate enough to combine the two things. And I've been always fortunate enough to have a great family that follow me and they share that passion with me. So you know, my battle with my kids at the moment is about, you know, what kind of skis are we gonna use for winter? Is that, uh, you know, we were in a store here um, a week ago and I was trying, well, maybe you should get a split board. And he's like, no, I don't want the split board. I want new ski touring uh, skis. Um, so it's, you know, all that are our debates. So it's, um, People sometimes will think that's not very good because you've got to keep work separate. I think every family finds its own balance. And I think I've been great enough that, you know, my family has been sharing my passion. Um, and we live this as a lifestyle. Yeah. You know, we live this inside the company as well as outside. And that has been a literally what has shaped the, the entire um, career that I have. I never really separate between work and passion. Yeah. And there's been, and again, I, I, I ask myself all the time, what would have happened if I was going to work for a bank? What would have happened if my wife would have said, sorry, I want to be a lawyer? You know, you have to take a step back and we're gonna share the family, the grown family. So all of these are sh choices. Can we do this in a formalized way? No. Um, what are the few things that you shape over your life that you, you know, you always drives what you, the, your choice is. And there's a lot around passion and motivation on what we do as a family. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and I always knew, I've always have known I was asking a lot to my family. I mean, I, I have high expectation at work and with the family, but at the same time, and again, people will say, you know, we don't care. We just want simple life. We want to live, you know, have a, just work a few days a week and just get out and do nothing and relax. And but the family has always been engaged with my passion. So it's been a, again, it's, I, I feel probably the most fortunate person in the world. So who would you say has been the person that stands out as somebody that's influenced you the most professionally? 
I've been fortunate enough to have great people next to me. Um, when I when I joined um, North Face, um, I had the, the CEO of North Face that literally gave me for Europe and then became the CEO globally, one of the most experienced Italian and later later um, later global leaders in our industry, uh, Karl Heinz Salzburger. He was great. He wasn't a mentor. He was just the, the guy that I was looking and saying, one day I want to be like him. Um, very charismatic, uh, very bold uh, experience. He was representing that global leader um, that really shaped the, the, the first part of my career. The second part was uh, more in the industry in the in the surf industry and again that was a it was different because i didn't have a boss near me my boss was in australia i was a public listed company and it was the first time i was running a company and i didn't know how to do that literally and, and again i thought it was good because the numbers were good but really i, I realized later i was pretty bad actually but um again the, the board and the ceo of australia at that time they were great mentors they weren't next to me uh, but they were bringing that um, seniority into the way of approaching decision, taking a step back and uh, making sure you were doing all the due diligence before making up a decision. And every time I was making up a decision, was I was deciding for, you know, a pretty large amount of people directly and indirectly through the business. So a great career. So, and when uh, obviously later on with Columbia was the chairman of Columbia, I mean, he's... It, he's a founder of the industry and he's still thinking one of the storytelling is, um, I remember walking in the business, so he picked me up uh, um, at the hotel when I was doing the interviewing process. And he says, well, you know, my mom still comes to the office and his mom was, uh, at that time, I think it was mid eighties. Um, and he will, and, and I thought, well, those are the kind of storytelling you tell to see the family engage. And literally we walk into the building uh, in Portland and I saw, I heard this big voice um, and she said, oh, you must be Franco. And, and she looks at me, I like your shoes actually. And uh, you know, those are charismatic people that with a few words they can shape who you are, what they can give you a, a, a very good uh, view. And, um, and Tim is uh, probably one of those uh, people where Passion has come to, you know, is second to none. He's, uh, I think he's now probably made mid seventies and still works as it was the first day. He's um, absolutely is motivating. And, uh, and I think that was very inspiring. Um, and later on, again, is uh, I think the, um, what I've been always very lucky and believe me, that wasn't a choice and it wasn't a structure and I'm really happy of doing this because I think there are so many opportunities for people for learning and I think I've been very fortunate but I'm also conscious there are a lot of people that haven't had this fortune and they never had the mentorship and uh, you know that's where the opportunity comes because as you, as leaders you have responsibilities and it comes and it's no longer you doing that only for passion when you wake up in the morning there are thousands of people depend on what or some of the choices you do, and you have to be responsible, and you have to make sure you're doing that in a structured way. So those mentors have been, over time, have been able to help me out. But now, after you know 30 years in the industry, I have a different approach. I structure who I want next to me. I have a rule. I want people that are better than me next to me, so I can learn all the time. Um, I'm, I'm passionate about learning, whether it is a new language, whether it is uh, new people, whether it is a new product or new innovation, a new sport, I always want to push the boundaries. And that's what motivates me. At the same time, you know, I wouldn't be able to make decision if I didn't have great people next to me that will help me to constantly evolve. And, uh, and honestly, put pressure on me to get better. When you have a, you know, when you, you go running with someone that is stronger with you and the climb comes and you see the guy going faster than you, boy, you feel a lot of pressure. Same story when you go skiing and you see, you know, whatever, a off-piste, off-piste and you feel the pressure and 
uh, is same story. You push the boundaries, and that's where I think the sports industry and the outdoor business is all about. And that's what makes uh, people better. And that's why one of the reasons why the industry has been growing and has become a lifestyle, because there's, um, it goes beyond the way you look like in, into who you are. And, uh, and that is uh, absolutely a massive differentiation. So again, I've, I've, um, I would also say that some of the best uh, slash leaders, mentors I met in my career, they're not big executives, they're not CEOs, they're not president. I walk into the building um, in a company every day and I go around talking to people. That's where I found some of the most inspiring leaders, people that don't have my responsibility, but they have the same passion and engagement. That's what is feeding me. Their smile, their happiness, their joy for what we do. Even said that they're not great, big executive, they're just people that are passionate about what to do. That's what is feeding me and what makes me better every day. That's what makes all our executives better. Yeah. So those are some of the kind of rules um, um, I've tried to establish over time. And, and again, I'm, I'm very thankful for what you're doing because uh, I think uh, I've been very lucky, but I think there are a lot of people that could have benefit for the experience um, we've done. And again, I got, you know, you learn more from mistakes and I guarantee you, uh, you know, I got hammered in few times, several times from my boss and in different situations for people next to me that were better than me. And boy, it's, you, you know, you kind of hit the wall and yes, it's not how many times you fall down is how many times you st there's always need to stand up once more. And that was make, make the difference. So learning by mistakes um, is very important, but it's also very important making sure that you have a structured way to constant learning. Uh, because obviously the more you grow up, the more your mistakes have impact on other people. So that's where you, you, know, you have the responsibility. You could say, well, doesn't matter if I make a mistake. Well, it does. It has an impact on the business, may have impact on jobs, and that's where the responsibility comes together with the, with the opportunity, I would say. You mentioned the pressure, and I think in any senior leadership role, I guess any role to a certain extent, you know, pressure can sometimes lead to stress. Stress can sometimes lead to anxiety. Do you have a way to to manage that yourself? Because I'm sure over your career, there's been periods of high stress. So. For sure, I go skiing and go running. Okay, this is um, what I suspected, but. <laughs> as, um, as simple as it is. Yeah. Um, no, I think, uh, look, I, I, you know, I have a rule of, I, I don't always achieve that, but at least the train one hour a day. Yeah. Um, and it's difficult because when you jump on a plane and all of this, but literally um, I got him to, I was a soccer player uh, doing a lot of sports in the mountain. I was a hiker, I was going uh, skiing, um, but I never look at running as uh, something very important in my career was, or what I wanted to do. I was running for training and ultimately I got into running and trail running because I was traveling and there was no other opportunity for train, and I was lucky enough to grow up with a culture of trail running in um, in the late 90s in California with the athletes from North Face, um, you know, going into uh, the marinas up there, um, and uh, and suddenly became a passion as a, as a need a need to trail to go outside and stay in nature. So to answer your question, yes, I go and have sports, uh, whether it is uh, Nordic skiing, skiing with the kids. Um, I call that the Zen that comes with the sport. People do yoga. Yeah. I go for two hours run and I go up in the mountain. Um, it allows me to connect with nature and I truly believe nature brings things back to simple. Um, when we run a busy life, planes, responsibility, board meeting and stuff like that, um, ultimately we'll, we'll get a little, I wouldn't say lost, but it gets complex. How do we bring that to the lower level? Nature, sport, uh, and that's to answer your question. That's it, what I do. And sometimes um, I have the pleasure to go here in the company. You know, at lunchtime I connect with people. I think one of the things I got told was like, "Oh, this is the first time we have the CEO of the company coming running with us." And I'm like, "Well, you guys want to have fun yourself without me? No way." 
I want fun. That's why I'm in this industry. So the, the passion around sport is, is what is driving. And again, as people do, um, my wife does Pilates, okay? okay. Um, people do yoga. I go running and I love it. I just love it. It's, uh, as, you know, there is not, I think at Columbia, uh, Tim used to say there's not, or Gerd used to say there's, not, there's nothing such like bad weather. There's only bad equipment, okay? We've got great equipment and um, we're in the outdoor industry. So there's bad weather, don't worry. Just put on a jack, get out. Yeah, yeah. so that's, and that, that's where passion gets together with, with the work and with finding the right balance. And again, it's, I wouldn't even call the right balance. There's no balance. It's, uh, sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low. If people ask me, what's next? I'm gonna run and ski. Okay, and the dream when I came to Salon was uh, skiing in the morning, trail running in the afternoon, and that still is my ambition. I don't get enough of that. Okay, well, I'm working hard to get there. Great, great. I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did. We love to read your feedback, so please leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks again for your support. See you soon, and don't forget to subscribe.